We're going to talk about these issues and a lot more. Jeff Kinley is an author of 40 books. He's host on his channel, Christian TV. Our Understanding the Times Radio also airs, by the way. He is co-host on the Prophecy Pros podcast with Todd Hampson. Jeff Kinley, welcome back to the program. Jan, great to be back with you. Oh, I have so many comments and notes in front of me, Jeff. You call the time period that we're talking about, we're looking back now at the days of Noah, a Mardi Gras on steroids. The whole planet hated the Creator. How does a society devolve like this, and how on earth did one man remain so righteous? And you talk about all of this in this wonderful book that I'll say more about later, but can you comment on this? How on earth can society, in other words, billions of people and only one righteous man? Well, it just speaks to the depravity of man. Jeremiah seventeen nine says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can even know it? Who can understand it? Left to ourselves, Jan, we devolve. Man never gets better on his own. He might create cures for diseases and go to the moon, but he can never become better morally. So what happens is in Noah's generation, as in ours, once we push God to the margins, as it says in Romans chapter one, we're basically left to ourselves and to our own futile speculations. And from that, there is this downward spiral that begins to gather steam, just like a snowball going down a hill. And pretty soon the momentum of immorality and godlessness on the planet becomes so large that it's undeniable. And so everyone is really caught up into that vortex. I want to read what you say on page 11 of As It Was in the Days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. And you write this, it's quite simple yet profound. You say a flood is coming. God is going to destroy this earth, including you, unless you repent. This was the core of Noah's message, simple, to the point, no beating around the bush. The preacher's sermon was plain, straightforward, and even uses an object lesson to illustrate the message's main point, the building of a very big boat. Noah's audiovisual sermon lasted 120 years, and you go on to say, and then the flood came and destroyed them all, just like that. But there's a bit more to this story. While describing the flood drama, what is often lacking amid tales of the old man in the ark, its animal kingdom occupants, and the terrible water judgment, is how God felt about the whole affair. We know it in the end. He brought judgment, but we fail to mention that the catastrophic event that annihilated mankind initially flowed not from a furious fist, but from a broken heart. God's spirit was grieved. He actually experienced sorrow an unusual concept to contemplate, particularly in the context of judgment. But there are facets of God's relationship with humankind that affect him emotionally, bringing lament and regret to his spirit. That's because God isn't some stoic, emotionless, distant deity, but rather a father who feels. I'm so glad you included that in the opening few pages of your book, Jeff. I don't think too many people stop to think that God was clearly grieved by what he had to do. Absolutely. In fact, it's a juxtaposition of judgment and mercy, judgment and grace. God knew in order to save humanity, he would first have to destroy it and then rebuild again through one righteous man, the man Noah. And so as we trace that whole narrative, Jan, of Noah's story, we really have made it either into a children's story of just giraffe heads sticking out of a boat all the way up to just saying, well, it was all about judgment and nothing else. And yet we forget the fact that God is the main character of the story, and his heart was actually broken. It grieves the heart of God to have to bring judgment on humanity, and yet this was what was needed because of the depth of the depravity. Well, it's coming again in the tribulation time, which we're not quite there in our discussion yet, but all of this is foreshadowing what is coming in that terrible tribulation period. I want to play one more clip, and then I want to come back and talk to you about Noah himself. Jeff, I want to talk about Mr. Noah here for a moment, because blameless in his time, he was 480 years old at the time, and he unmistakably heard God's voice, and he never questioned it. And he may have questioned his assignment, but he did not question the word that was giving the assignment. Describe the blueprint for the ark. 522 standard railroad cars sealed with pitch. An amazing feat in Noah's day when you consider there's no Home Depot, yeah. there are no power tools. There are no huge construction crews to call upon. Noah essentially was left to himself. Now, we don't know if his sons were able to help him out at some point 
or he had some other relatives around him. But basically building anything of that size in that time would be a Herculean task. And this boat was 450 feet long and 45 feet high and 75 feet wide. Obviously took a long time to do. But can you imagine, Jan, going out to the forest every day and sawing down trees, yeah. chopping down trees, hauling them back to the job site, beginning to hewn them, to strip them of their bark, sawing them up, putting them into place, making notches. All of these things Noah did by hand. So Noah's faith was a very long walk of obedience. It was a daily kind of faith. And yet he didn't come to that faith, Jan, by himself. As we look at Scripture and we look at Genesis chapter 5, we find out that Noah came from a godly heritage. His was a grounded faith. He had a legacy, a lineage of faith. He had men who had come before him who had passed on the truth of God to him. In fact, we know that his father was a man by the name of Lamech, who was a godly man who prophesied even about Noah himself. His grandfather was, of course, Methuselah, who lived to be 969 years. Then, of course, Enoch, who was so godly that the Bible says the Lord just took him to heaven. If you think about it, Noah's life wasn't an accident. It was a faith that had been faithfully passed down like a baton mm -hmm. to him. The result is, in the midst of all of this society that is literally soaked in sin, there is this one righteous man that is blameless in his time, and God tapped him on the shoulder and said, I want you to do something very bizarre, but also very difficult that'll take a long time to complete. And Noah said, yes, Lord. The other thing very unusual, Jeff Kinley, is it never rained. No wonder people laughed at him. I don't think they knew what rain was. No, in fact, Genesis tells us, Genesis chapter 2, and verse 6, that a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. And many people believe there was a protective water canopy that filtered out the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. And that would explain one reason why mankind lived as long as he did. Yeah, it never rained. So think about Noah is bringing to his generation a message that sounds unbelievable. And so it brought him surely a lot of mocking, ridicule, saying, surely the Lord is not going to come and bring judgment. They mocked him. They mocked God. This was 120 years of intense labor, as you said, and intense preaching. Talk about a preacher who had no response. Many pastors listening to this, and they have very little response. They can identify a little bit here with Noah. Jeff, I wonder about communication at that time, because it's estimated that there were several billion, perhaps eight, nine billion people on the planet at that time. No communication, no internet, no TV, no computers, no radio, no YouTube. How on earth did the message get spread across to these billions of people that Noah was doing what he was doing and saying what he was saying? No communication, no tools like we have today. It makes sense that humanity was a little bit more concentrated at that time. Surely they were spread out to some degree, but they were indeed population of up into the billions, eight or nine billion. But you think about that Noah is building this ark. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon that once said, if you want to draw a crowd, set yourself on fire and people just come to watch you mm -hmm. burn. And Noah was building this huge ark. I don't know if people even knew what a boat was. Yeah. And so he's building this thing, Jan. I talk about in the book how they must have called it Noah's Folly. Here's the crazy old lunatic building this monstrosity there. So I think the ark itself was surely an attraction. It was sort of a novelty. But Peter tells us that Noah was also a preacher of righteousness. When he wasn't working on the ark, he was preaching about this judgment to come. So God had really multiple levels of warning people about that coming global storm. Going back to Methuselah, we learned that Methuselah's name originally meant, when he is gone, it shall come, or his death shall bring it. And all of Methuselah's life was a preaching tool. Every time someone said the name Methuselah, they were prophesying about the flood. And the Bible tells us in Genesis that in the very year that Methuselah died, the floodgates opened. So when he died, it indeed came. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Little Rock, Arkansas, Jeff Kinley, because we carry, well, quite frankly, carry a number of his books, and I'll give you the names of the others. But the one we're featuring, this program, and the one I'm emphasizing because I love the content, as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. We're talking about, well, the assignment that Noah had so many millennia ago, 
that he was the only righteous man in his generation. The mocking that he endured, both Noah, quite frankly, they mocked God at the same time. The world was godless. My question, Jeff Kinley, did they even have a conscience left? Had they degraded that much, sin was their only means of functioning. So perhaps their conscience was seared back then. I believe it was, Jan. In fact, back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm -hmm. Jan, I have trouble wrapping my mind around that yes. concept, yes. that every human being was just completely filled with wickedness. They were soaked with sin. Every molecule of their mind was just concentrated on how can I please myself and serve myself. What's crazy is, is that today I look around and I see people just, as Romans 1 says, inventors of evil. We're coming up with new ways to invent evil. I mean, even a minor example is the way that they are promoting the mutilation of children yeah. with this gender reassignment surgery. Who would have thought, even just a few years ago, that our own government, our president, and the powers that be in our country would be promoting this and telling us that we are sinful for trying to keep this from happening, not only destroying children in the womb, but also mutilating them as young children. I think you go back to the days of Noah, you think about the mind of man. Noah was a very intelligent man. It took sin a while to completely corrupt the human mind. Men were creating buildings and projects. So when you get to Genesis chapter 6, certainly mankind used that same creativity, that same sense of depravity to seek new ways to sin. That's why verse 5 was written, and that's why the very next verse says the Lord was very grieved for it. Play one more clip this segment. This particular clip is talking about, well, people were caught unaware in the days of Noah. They're going to be caught unaware again because Jesus Christ is going to come back and many, many people are going to be caught completely unaware, even though they've been warned, just as they were warned during Noah's generation. The generation of Noah that disbelieved the possibility of a flood didn't stop the flood from taking them unaware. It came in a time they never expected. They had the opportunity to get into the ark and become safe from the flood. But they chose to turn deaf ears to the words of Noah. They could not blame God for being heartless. They only had themselves to blame. For being unwise in their decisions because they all had the choice to get into the ark. And oh, the flood came. Imagine how they felt when they heard thunder roar and the lightning flash. And that first drop of rain came. They all thought of Noah as the floodgates of heaven poured. And as water began to pour out of the ground and they tried to swim as fast as they could, they climbed mountains trying to get to higher ground. The day the flood came, they were all caught unaware. This is the same way Christ will show up one day and people will be caught unaware. Those years it took before God finally vented his anger on the people. They would have taken him for granted and some would have made mockery of Noah. But when the time of patience elapses, it will be the turn of humans to beg God. Unfortunately, it may be too late to obtain mercy. Luke 17, 26 through 27 says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. On the line, Jeff Kinley. You can learn more at jeffkinley.com, Main Thing Ministries, jeffkinley.com. Basing my conversation for the hour on the book as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. Jeff, I'm just reading another paragraph that you've written here. You're referring here to Noah. You say, surely he lay in bed some nights during those 120 years, wide awake, with throbbing back pain, gashed leg, or swollen and bruised knuckles, wondering, God, is all this really worth it? Is this flood really going to happen, or did I imagine it? Is my boat going to float, or will I sink and drown like the rest? Did you really speak to me all those years ago, or am I wasting my time and my life? 
Are the skeptics and the cynics right in what they say about me? Will I be proved a fool? Is this the only way you can save us? Isn't there any easier way for you to accomplish your will? Now, you made that conversation up, but I thought it was profound. Yeah, you think about Noah. I mean, just put feet on the Scripture here and to think into what was really going on. In fact, when we read Scripture, Jan, we need to immerse ourselves into the text anyway and just look around and go, what must have been going on in Noah's life? And I think, obviously, as he's going through these type of experiences, he wanted to please God. He wanted to serve God. But his faith was a weathered faith. Noah had calluses on his hands. And thousands and thousands of days he spent working on this thing. Long bouts, surely because he's a human being, bouts with doubt, bouts with discouragement, bouts with loneliness. But he chose to believe God over a long period of time. It may have cost him relationships. It may have cost him whatever business he may have had in that day. But God's call on his life meant that he had to get dirty. He had to do the hard thing, that there were no easy road. He had to be willing to bleed, to have scars. Today, we want the perks with no pain. We want success with no sacrifice. But Jesus said, your faith in this world will mean sacrifice. They will mock your belief in Jesus and his return. And I would venture to say right now, Jan, there are people listening that are asking themselves, like Noah, did I imagine this whole Bible prophecy thing? Did I imagine the rapture? Was I wrong about the tribulation coming and the second coming and heaven and hell? Did I misread God here? Because we're outnumbered billions to one, like Noah was. So we walk a very narrow path. We carry a message that is unpopular, that people do not want to hear. And therefore, they're trying to choke out the message of prophecy, the message of the gospel. And so, like Noah, we have to keep picking up that hammer and going to work every day and continuing to persevere in our faith. And I guess that's one thing, Jan, I would say I admire most about Noah is that there was nothing casual about his faith. You can't fake an ark. People can fake their Christianity, but you can't fake an ark. He just got up every day, went to work, was committed to doing what God had called him to do. Well, as you say, ours is a generation of quick fixes. So true. You called it the microwave generation. And how could this even happen today? What we're describing here and what the Bible describes seems unthinkable. One more thought here before we go into part two of my programming. But I think one of the amazing facts is God brought the animals. Somehow he gave them the instinct to find Noah perhaps over hundreds, perhaps even thousands of miles, to the very location of the ark. What must the onlookers have thought? What about wild flesh-eating beasts? They must have suddenly settled down for this little journey to the ark and even on the ark. But can you imagine these heathens who are watching all of this and suddenly, two by two, these animals come strolling right up to Noah? I cannot picture, my imagination can't quite fill everything in. Well, it's a supernatural event, I believe, that God drew the animals in. But here's another thing to think about, too, is that as people watch those animals surely make their way toward the ark, it's really kind of a judgment on humanity again. It's kind of a prejudgment saying even the animals know to obey God. You're not even connecting with God as much as the animal kingdom is. So where does that place you? Today, I mean, we're seeing the simplicity of just believing in Jesus is so simple But at the same time, people want to shun it. Like you said, they want to be distracted and diverted to other desires. So I think that the animals coming to the ark being a supernatural thing was also a way to tell humanity, look, you better get on board because even the animals know what's coming. Even the animals know what's coming. And I want to get to a comment or two in part two of my programming. What is going on in America, in the world, even in the church, but we've got school shootings, we've got political turmoil, we've got natural disasters that are setting all sorts of new records. We've got economic woes, inflation, digital currency on the horizon. My hunch is God's trying to get a message to us. The world is literally in every kind of turmoil you can imagine, including weather turmoil. I'm coming back in just a minute or two. Don't go away. Again, talking to Jeff Kinley, jeffkinley.com, as it was in the days of Noah. I think this story alone, the story of Noah, is one of the most remarkable in the Bible. And it was a day when one person warned of judgment. Today, the church is warning that judgment is coming. And again, most of the world ignoring the warnings. 
Coming right back. Don't go away. When you look at Romans chapter 8, uh, Jimmy, the Bible talks about how the creation itself is groaning right. for redemption. Uh, the whole earth is just saying, gosh, well, I'm, I'm just tired of being here and <laughs> it needs to be remade. Yeah. And so uh, that's I think that's one of the things we're seeing right now. And of course, uh, just like birth pangs, these things do increase with intensity and frequency. And so I think we're seeing with with nature itself. I mean, you're seeing storms uh, being uh you know, produced and, and going across the planet and, and all sorts of catastrophes and nationwide disasters and things like that. But yeah, I do think these earthquakes uh, are increasing. And of course, uh, there's going to be a giant earthquake on the Mount of Olives when Jesus Christ touches his foot down there. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12 tells us. So, so yeah, there's going to be an increase, I believe, in these things as we approach the end times. 